Hello, you're tuned to Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond, contemporary conversations where stories, science, traditions and new ideas meet. Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond. It's about family, connected parenting, celebrating your amazing body, connection with your community and finding your truth. Our show is coming to you from the studios of Bay FM in Byron Bay and is broadcasting across Australia on the Community Radio Network and globally via our podcast at pbbmedia.org. This episode of Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond, we'll be speaking with Angel Temple. She's a New Zealand trained midwife with a postgraduate education in gender studies. She's been practicing in Australia for the past two years as a remote rural midwife. Um, Angel is really in a unique position to see the differences between the systems of maternity care. So right now in Australia, the systems and policies that make up our maternity health care are being reviewed by the Australian government. And many of the stakeholders are adding in their voice, their experience and opinions on where maternity should be headed. But as consumers, we sit at the heart of the discussion. And it is, after all, us, the bill and us that is affected in the short and long term from the care that we receive or don't receive. So the maternity service in New Zealand specifically is an integrated system of primary, secondary and tertiary care. Primary maternity care is provided by lead maternity carers, LMCs, who take responsibility for the care provided women throughout pregnancy, during labour and birth and up to six weeks following birth. And that's majority of that is led by midwives in New Zealand. And we're going to talk about that as well. But in Australia, we have a mixed bag of fragmented maternity care with every woman across the country susceptible to various levels, uh, levels of quality and access in service. So for example, GP shared care or obstetrician led care or midwifery group practice or private midwife led care, you know, you name it, it exists here or even first come first serve type of care at a hospital. And with 98% plus of women giving birth in a hospital, so you need to be looking at how all it smoothly runs. So some of the reasons for, for this fragmented care are really obvious, like how massive our country is and how hard it is to provide services of the same quality and quantity to all Australians. And some are less obvious and sit more behind the scenes, making detection of these issues and accountability, holding, holding those uh, responsible accountable, kind of like a murky business. These are the things that the prevailing culture uh, in a workplace turf wars between different healthcare providers, hospital policies which have not to do with science and healthcare, uh, specific policies which, which are like that, and doctors' unions, for example, insurance and so on. So these things are steering the outcomes of conversations here in Australia with maternity care, but we won't be discussing all of this today in our really short interview. However, we will be having a peek into how a more smooth and accountable system runs and works and the impact it has on consumers and the maternity health care workers alike. Angel, that's really interesting. So that's a really quite a comprehensive system and that is well utilised by, by most of women in New Zealand and, and it runs quite smoothly, doesn't it, if, if I understand correctly? It runs smoothly in the context of the fact that we have better outcomes for women. Mm -hmm. so, um, so when women are choosing midwives, they're choosing primary care, which mm -hmm. means they have a normal pregnancy, which is uncomplicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so midwives inherently by, by um, their choice of vocation and, mm -hmm. and the principles that underline midwifery practice, we, we view childbirth as a, a normal life event, not something that is to be medicalised. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so our, our fundamental philosophies within midwifery are to protect normal birth. That is actually our statement. We are guardians of normal birth. Wow. So when women... In, the, the smoothness of the systems mean that women are seen as central to mm -hmm. their care. The foundation of power for midwives rests in the women that they, ad they attend. Mm. They make the choices, they, they make the decisions based on their bodies and their needs after making informed choices with all the information provided for them. Mm -hmm. So it's smooth in that way in the fact that we, uh, midwives, there's a lot of midwifery-led units, so these mm -hmm. are primary units led just by midwives, um, and it means that they've got more opportunities for normal birth. We mm -hmm. know that within these primary units, we have less interventions. Mm -hmm. So we have less instrumental births, less caesarean sections, uh, less inductions of labours. That keeps women safer. Mm, absolutely, yeah. 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 It's funny, here in Australia, um, 
maternity and and you really touched on that uh, beautifully that midwives in New Zealand see childbirth as first and for- foremost a natural physiological process that is happening in the body and then if needed then we receive medical care while as here in Australia it's quite the opposite it's already seen in a medical framework and then good luck trying to mm. achieve a natural childbirth in it, within that system because it's it's um, primed for medical intervention because mm. it's existing within that framework. A- absolutely. Yeah. And, and this is what was um, fundamental in our decision to mm-hmm. uh, separate ourselves from nursing, to establish ourselves as, as maternity specialists, mm-hmm. that yeah, we, we removed women from that medical model. Mm-hmm. Um, we do work in collaboration with other services, but essentially we, we've created our framework so they are uh, consumer-led and primary focused. Amazing. And before that, so this is something that happened at a certain point in New Zealand Mm -hmm. healthcare history. So how long has this system been as it is? 1990 saw the regain of autonomy for midwives in New Zealand. What's remarkable about it is that during the 80s, there was a huge consumer and midwifery-led political activism Mm -hmm. against reclaiming all birth and reclaiming autonomy of midwives. Mm. Women in the community wanted choices. They Mm -hmm. wanted their power back in childbirth and they wanted to be supported in that. And Mm -hmm. by having publicly funded access to these services, it meant that everybody, regardless of status and economic status, Mm -hmm. was able to access and have choices within their birthing process. And this is quintessential Mm -hmm. to uh, empowering women as women, as mothers, and how they go on and, and go into the future supporting their families. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is really that maternity care is, is consumer-led, it really. It's, it's consumer-focused, consumer-centric, mm-hmm. and then it's led by the carer that the consumer chooses. Mm-hmm. And there are options, there are choices to choose from for every person. 6% who choose an mm-hmm. LMC. So, mm-hmm. so within that, we've got, I think, uh, 1.6% who choose mm-hmm. a GP, mm-hmm. and we have 5.3% who choose an obstetrician. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting statistic right there because in Australia, at the moment, we're having a review of the maternity health care system mm-hmm. by the government. So the government's doing this massive review of the maternity health care system and trying to improve it. And it's taken loads and loads of um, feedback from from everybody, all the stakeholders, um, primarily consumers, of course, because mm-hmm. that's that's where they want to be at. They're, tr- they're striving for that. Because at the moment, it's not consumer-centric so much and, and not necessarily evidence-based. And they're really wanting to go ahead and, and make strides and change the system. Mm-hmm. However, because of different political or, or um, kind of um, business th- thinking that exists within the system already that are steering the conversation and and pushing for autonomy for um you know against autonomy of midwifery in in a way because of how so far um it it has been operating and who's been benefiting from Mm -hmm. the way the system works so far there is um a drive from obstetricians and gps to kind of hog the hog the mlc if you'd like um positions and and really obstetricians and gp obstetricians want to be the only lead care and then they work in collaboration with everybody else that is the statement actually that they've made just recently finally enough they've made this statement after the the second round has closed so there's no more they're not taking the government's not taking any more advice from anybody they've heard everything and right at the very end as if to say this is the last word the ama the australian medical association has put out a statement saying that obstetricians and gp obstetricians should be the main carers Mm-hmm. And in a way, they're kind of really forcing themselves, you know, this kind of last, the last, the last word into the conversation. And it's interesting to see when choice is provided to consumers, and there is in um, congruency and continuity within care for mothers. And this, we're talking about maternity consumers. We're not talking about a uh, heart health, heart, you know, heart disease consumers. This is a very specific health consumer that lives outside of the disease paradigm because we assume when birth happens it's a natural physiological process and then something can go wrong and then we treat and care not the other way around which is how all the other basically healthcare you know operates mm-hmm. so it's interesting to see that that when there is provided that women do choose the more more the way that honors that aspect you know that they naturally want to choose that 
Absolutely. Mm. And, and, and just to speak to that um, resistance which is being presented by the Australian Medical Association, mm. the issues that I've seen here in Australia making the transition from New Zealand to Australia is is not the fact that uh, midwives aren't prepared for autonomous practice. They, they certainly are. They, I mean, they've only recently regained their autonomy. Uh, but the, the issues are the funding structure, yeah. which means that midwives can't claim directly from the Medicare rebates, mm. which means that women in Australia do not have universal access to midwifery-led care. Yeah. It means that uh, under the current scheme, the, the people who are benefiting the most from um, maternity funding are private obstetricians. So they represent 33% of the capture rate of people who are engaging with those services, of mm-hmm. all women who are birthing in Australia, 33% are birthing with uh, private obstetricians. Wow. The cost of that to, to Australian taxpayers, due to the way the system is this uh, kind of safety net, which was set up in like the early 2000s, mm-hmm. in excess of $211 million. Wow. This is just for the private sector. Mm-hmm. So you could see why the, pri- the so obstetricians... all of Australians are paying that, regardless absolutely. of whether they access Regard- that. Yes. We're, we're all contributing to that, whether yes. or not we want to have that option, uh, whether we like it or not, basically. It's yeah. kind of forced upon us, in absolutely. a way. Absolutely. Yeah. Private obstetricians in, uh, in private practice mm-hmm. have access to uncapped rebates, mm-hmm. um, which is part of this, again, this safety net. You, you, you can see the motivation behind the Australian Medical Association trying to restrict midwives' access to uh, Medicare rebates because they will miss out on a lot of their funding if that goes mm-hmm. that way. And if it was to lead the way of uh, New Zealand women, Australian women will more than likely, I would assume, choose midwives. It's been my experience uh, mm. and the experience of other midwives in New Zealand that when given the choice, women want to birth with midwives and they want to birth with female attendants. Yes, that's beautifully said. I couldn't agree more as a woman as well and as a consumer, maternity consumer representative. I speak to hundreds of women and that has been the overwhelming census amongst women. Not all women choose. A lot of women want to have obstetrician and, um, and that's totally okay. Women should be able to have the choice between different models of care that are very responsible and evidence-based and and accountable to the way they operate. Tune in to Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond, contemporary conversations where stories, science, traditions and new ideas meet. Hear from local and international families and experts on all things maternity, parenting, community and women's well-being. Join us on the Community Radio Network each Friday at 1.30pm. Find us at pbbmedia.org. Analia Tia on the Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond show. I'm speaking with Angel Temple today, a New Zealand educated midwife who has been working here in Australia for the past two years. What I do here in Australia is I actually work for an agency. I do remote rural. It means that I go to a variety of different places in Australia that has a shortfall and has a need for midwives. And I work there under an agency contract. It, the contract can be as little as six weeks, up to six months. A uh, paradigm for agency, New Zealand midwives are very much in demand. Interesting. Uh, this is interesting. Yeah. And by uh, the Australian healthcare system. By, by the Australian healthcare system. Mm. Or, 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 well, usually the, um, the, the, the charge midwives who are mm. in charge of a unit, if they have, have understanding and they're like, oh, it's a Kiwi midwife, mm. they want this person. And, yeah. and now, Why is that? Let's break. I think this is a really critical point in terms of how we view, how we think, you know, the perceptions of, of maternity care in general and mm-hmm. what is needed, what's really needed mm. versus what... Um, you know, versus what is is really needed. Mm. It's there's two different things: perception of what we think is needed, and oh, we should have an obstetrician, you know, for every woman because just in case. Versus actually having an obstetrician in the picture all the time increases the risk, and it's something that we need to look at. If there's nothing wrong, if yep. there's nothing wrong to begin with, if there's a natural, healthy pregnancy going on, and the pregnancy is low risk, there's absolutely 
don't need to involve an obstetrician unless something goes wrong mm-hmm. because it increases the risk if there's nothing going on that's not needed. Yeah. A- absolutely. And yeah. and just, just to speak to that briefly mm-hmm. as well, when we do bring in an obstetrician, midwives are still working in collaboration with the woman and with the obstetrician. In New Zealand. In New Zealand. Yes. And, and still here, you mm-hmm. know. So even, yeah. even when we're engaging in the hospital system here in Australia, The midwives are still present. The midwives are still doing all of that primary care. The midwives Mm -hmm. are still doing labour and birth care up until the last moment where Mm -hmm. the obstetrician arives. Yes. You know? (laughs) Yes. So it's really the frustration of my Australian colleagues. They want to have the last word, but they arrived at the end to to see what it is that they think is happening rather than continuously being part of the conversation throughout to really understand what's going on. Well, and they become the focus Mm. of of that moment Mm. of, of birth. It's actually not their focus. It's mm. actually the woman's moment. Mm. A, yeah. a very great midwife told me that at the end of a woman's labour and birth, she shouldn't remember you as a midwife. Mm. She should remember that she was cared for and she was supported, mm. but she shouldn't remember you. Mm. And that stuck with me. That's the that forms my practice. It's mm. not about me. It's not about what I know. It's about looking after that woman, supporting her, empowering her to make choices that are right for her. Mm. As far as being in demand within the Australian system, I, I think that speaks to our level of education. Mm. In New Zealand, free is a four-year equivalent degree, mm-hmm. bachelor degree. Undertake two thousand four hundred theory hours mm-hmm. and two thousand four hundred clinical practice hours. Mm-hmm. Once we graduate, fully autonomous practitioners to provide uh, primary maternity care for women under our own responsibility. We have full prescribing rights, Mm -hmm. full hospital admission rights, access to diagnostics, referral processes. Mm -hmm. We call this direct entry midwifery, Mm -hmm. which has been in place in New Zealand since 1992. Because of the the length of time that we've had this system and robustness of this system, Mm -hmm. this this is a very difficult program. Yes. <laughs> Midwifery education, I, I know in Australia as well, I know some mm. people currently studying, it is very challenging. Yes. The work is serious, people take it seriously and it is complex because mm. at the end of it, a midwife is a maternity specialist. Mm. She's not a nurse who has a specialties in other areas who mm. might do general nursing and then go on to do her specialty. From day one, she mm. is a maternity specialist. I find that some of my experience here, some of the culture shock that I experienced for the, coming from New Zealand to Australia was this attitude towards direct entry midwives from some of the existing midwives who may have come up through that nurse midwife economy mm-hmm. particularly through the doctors and the obstetricians I've had um, many impassioned conversations mm. with doctors telling me I think midwives should uh, not forget their nursing foundations they shouldn't forget their nursing roots and, and this speaks a well, lot. Well, that's quite funny. Let's correct this right now yeah. because it, that's a wonderful statement to make if it was true. Mm. Uh, but it is not true. Absolutely. Midwives are not, don't have their roots in nursing at all, actually. Midwifery existed as a standalone role that women undertook within communities for thousands of years, way before nursing was ever invented or even, mm. you know, even created as how we know it today. Even when nursing was created, it, it, it had its role they might nurses might have taken on some of the roles of midwives, but that only happened after criminalized was, by yeah. by the medical system that became you know when it became um, industrialized. Absolutely, but we'll, we, this is a totally big topic to talk about in another. It, it is a big another. topic, but it, it really it, it's important to mm. understand where we've come from to understand yeah. where we are today. And mm. when we talk about women being supported by midwives or women female attendants in childbirth, mm. this has been happening globally since we were humans. Yeah. So before we've had like uh, infrastructure to support and pay mm. this and regulate it, there have always been midwives. We've mm. always been doing this thing, and mm. even in a contemporary format we we just need to look at this in the last hundred years for example Mm -hmm. were autonomous midwives practicing absolutely they they had they had a legislation to protect their practice and Mm -hmm. it wasn't up until like the 1920s that this started to change Mm -hmm. and there was an active push by the um, medical practitioners Mm -hmm. to move in childbirth into the medical realm yes yeah Mm -hmm. and that happened across the world in different ways and in different times and like uh, the women's push to, to be able to vote. It's happened around the world in different times. Mm-hmm. You know, in Australia, we became the first women to, to ever in the whole world to be able to vote. I actually, you know that? we were in New Zealand. It was, it was New, New Zealand. Zealand. 
bit of turf for us. Yeah, here, absolutely. <laughs> Good. I'm glad we um, <laughs> revived that old chestnut. Yes, thank you. for. I, I didn't actually know that, so that's wonderful. And you see, this is the thing. Sometimes we have to admit when we're wrong and admit when we didn't know something. I think that's an important part of, of um, discourse that we that we need to be having as you know as community as as mm. humanity mm. we're making all these statements and we want to feel right about them and if we've said them then we don't want to be proven wrong because that will impact our reputation but actually it is in fact the key to to having a more successful society where everybody is included where everybody has equal rights and where everybody is respected for their choices and the way they live and who they want to be human rights are fully respected not just stated Mm. Then, then we need to be able to admit to when we didn't know something or we were wrong about something or we didn't quite get it or when we need to change our ways and have a look at better ways and ways of collaborating and working together and not kind of be in our silos of, of rightness. Absol- absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think, um, I, I don't think this is unique for midwifery in particular, mm-hmm. but it, when it comes to pregnancy and childbirth, it's in a, in a social setting, it's really framed by fear and, mm. and risk management. Look at the way the media represents childbirth where mm. it hand picks adverse outcomes as opposed to the overwhelming majority which are really excellent outcomes mm. for women in pregnancy and childbirth i mean mm. it, we are we have been increasingly it's the safest time to give birth in yeah. the, in in the history of, of humanity we mm. you know we, we have we, so much more understanding and mm-hmm. but this fear which is shaped and this risk management protocols which are put in place create defensive practice mm. and so when we have this division between medical practitioners and and midwives there is there's animosity there's mm. contention uh, you know obstetricians and midwives um really hold different perspectives on how um, maternity services should be delivered. Mm. Whereas a midwife sees this as a normal life event, the the doctor, the medical um, system views mm. it as ri- risk management within a medico-legal framework. Which is what their training is it, and which precisely. is what there needs to be in case there is an issue. Mm-hmm. They need to be able to come in and say, right, what something's gone wrong, they need to think quick, what's gone wrong, how do we fix it, how do we help, mm-hmm. you know, but they cannot do that outside of collaboration. They cannot do that as a main... What we found with the implementation of the LMC um, system mm-hmm. was that from uh, 2001 to 2010, globally there was a rise in interventions in pregnancy. Mm-hmm. This was instrumental deliveries, inductions of labour and caesarean mm-hmm. sections. Mm-hmm. We found in New Zealand we were quite unique explicitly com- compared to Australia in that while our intervention still rose with that global trend, we still managed to keep them lower than any other developing nation. We kept them lower and we've maintained them lower. They haven't mm-hmm. continued to rise. As far as judging the actual necessary rates of intervention, mm-hmm. really difficult to speak to. You, you can examine it from cesarean section rate. So here in Australia, the cesarean section rate is currently sitting at about 35%, Mm -hmm. whereas the World Health Organization clearly states that any cesarean section in a population over 10% is deemed medically unnecessary. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is during the 70s, we noticed a rise in cesarean sections. Mm -hmm. This led on to the cesarean sections. Mm -hmm. And still, this is what we see today. Even with information and more education around uh, VBAC, which is a vaginal birth after caesarean section, mm-hmm. it's still not a tried and tested practice I find here in mm-hmm. Australia. Th- that's just my personal experience. I can't yeah. speak to uh, national statistics on that, yeah. but I know there's a very short threshold for doctors allowing a woman to have a vaginal birth after a cesarean section. Yes, and um, for those of you who are not in the studio, which is everybody except me and Angel, that didn't see Angel doing the brackets over (laughs) allowing, uh, this is a really important point because um, language that is used within the maternity healthcare system today is impacting hugely on the way healthcare reception is re- is perceived so if a woman thinks that she's not allowed and that language is used all of the time then she'll think that you know she's not allowed you know that that's not okay it's not allowed here so she'll go down making her choice in brackets mm-hmm. thinking that that's the right choice for her because she was not allowed this other choice but actually being allowed is it those are not the kind of words we can 
or should be using within maternity healthcare system or within any healthcare system. We, we're not allowed by anybody. Our human rights clearly define that we make a choice about what is right for our bodies, when and where it is right, regardless of regardless of reason, regardless of reason, what seems to be reasonable to everybody else in the room, it, it can only be defined by our own reason. That is a basic human right. Mm. So there's no such thing as being allowed or not allowed. So I really want to clarify that because that's a heavily used term. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think this is one of the strengths of the uh, New Zealand system is mm. that midwives are positioned as advocates for women. And because women have direct access to their midwife, they don't fall under this uh, cultured notion of subservience that we're expected to have mm -hmm. in pregnancy or childbirth as women to our medical hierarchies. Yeah. The number of times uh, I've heard women say to me, am I allowed to go home? Mm. Am I allowed to do this? I take the, that opportunity to remind them at any time that you engage with medical services, you are there for medical advice only. Mm. All of the decision is, is your decisions. You mm. make every decision for yourself at any time. Yeah. And this is, again, within the frameworks of, of medico-legal frameworks. Mm. There's a lot of resistance to that. Uh, everyone wants to not be blamed for anything or not be accountable for, mm. for anything. So there's a lot of push to make the woman feel... Um, to feel isolated and to feel like she's doing the wrong thing if she declines mm. a certain procedure or declines. Yeah. I mean, episiotomy is a, is a great example of that. I'm sure you've heard stories. I've seen examples of women not giving consent for episiotomies mm -hmm. at that moment of birth and then being cut anyway. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, I've heard direct stories of women saying, directly saying, no, they don't want it and still being cut. Absolutely. And, you know... <laughs> And, and this is yes. and this is where the midwife in New Zealand is mm. very uh, her her role is so defined and she's so staunch and she's respected mm. for her knowledge base and she's respected for her professionalism mm. that when when she speaks for that woman in her most vulnerable moment she's listened to she's yes. heard in that yeah. um, she stands by the woman she protects her and, and her baby. Jill, from your point of view, what are some of the things that we can do here in Australia to help improve our maternity healthcare system from going from a them to a more cohesive, mm. uh, consumer-centric care system. Mm. Mm. You know, I, I think that that's quite complex in nature. Um, any any discourses of resistance take time to develop. Um, any changes to primary and public health services take considerable time to turn clinical practice and and social expectations around at a population-based level. But I think the movement itself needs to come from the woman and her families. It's been a pleasure being with you today. Angel, thank you so much for your insight, your contribution, your time, your dedication, and your willingness to show up and discuss these really important matters. Thank you. Thank you so much for the thank opportunity. <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond. Tune in next week for more information and inspiration, bringing us full circle. You can find our show on iTunes, Spreaker, the usual social media under Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond and our website at pbbmedia.org.